So, um, I'm Ryan Squire. I work at the Ohio State University Medical Center. My background, I came from uh, WCMH TV before here in Columbus as their managing editor. And uh, I work specifically with Ohio State uh, with the Medical Center, and I do social and digital media. And uh, so my responsibilities, uh, the reason I was hired was um, to create a social and digital media program for the Medical Center, whatever that means. Um, really what I've worked on since I've been there is policy and uh, trying to figure out how we can use social technologies to better healthcare. Um, and so that's what we're looking at today. And, um, so this is the problem that we have in healthcare. Not that this is going to surprise many people, but uh, the way we're looking at this is that medicine has been historically and, and even today very reactive in nature. Um, <coughs> you know, they only provide care uh, once you get sick. You know, there's, there's not any thought about how to keep you healthy or what health is, especially when we talk about healthcare in general, certainly. Uh, insurance companies aren't set up necessarily to keep you healthy. They're set up to pay when you get sick. Mm -hmm. um, reactive care addresses the uh, the diseases and, and not the cause. So, um, heart disease, for instance, uh, you know, instead of uh, you know the care that you receive is to fix your heart, repair your heart, make it work again, pull the you know the the veins out of your legs so that your heart keeps going and you stay alive, as opposed to maybe the genetic factors or any of the underlying you know the the plaque. I mean. In, in, in smoking, some of those underlying factors. Healthcare uh, doesn't generally pay to fix those things, which are the root causes. Um, and, uh, and so because of that, we have these uncontrollably rising costs that everybody talks about. Um, the, the quality you know, of, of care that you receive is, is diminished. And obviously, um, our consumer base, our patients, because um, we don't treat them as customers, we treat them as patients, um, are, uh, are dissatisfied with what they're receiving. So that's kind of the ecosystem and setting it up. Um, you know, if you haven't seen before, you know, we way outspend any other countries as far as healthcare um, by far, by almost fifty percent, compared to the next one closest to us. Um, the higher, the more money we spend on healthcare um, is not, and in some cases even disproportionately related to the uh, the, the the actual outcomes, which is obviously problematic. Uh, you can, I mean, see life expectancy between other developed nations. Um, you know, which is extremely telling of, of our ability to, you know, so we spend more money than any other country, and yet, you know, you look at, at, at just the life expectancy, um, the outcomes. And, uh, and this one is, is what our, our recent uh, health care reform was, was supposed to take care of, or supposed to look at taking care of, and I think that it's a step forward, and, and, and you know, all the politics aside, um, it's something. But uh, this has obviously been the problem um, in the United States is finding care. And, uh, and, and the trend really in, in health care that we're dealing with is this uh, chronic disease situation. So, you know, the diabetes and, and, and heart disease, um, cancer. Uh, so many of what we pour most of our money in, and I think it's 80% of all the $2 trillion that we'll spend on health care, goes directly towards that reactive, um, that reactive medicine um, with with chronic diseases, and so so little of the money is actually is actually, and, and it's going to get worse. So, uh, according to the CDC, by 2025, half of the U.S. population um, will have a chronic disease, and they they would consider um, obesity a chronic disease as well, just because of the fact that it causes so many other diseases. So it's a disease in and of itself. Um, so half, um, one out of two people in this room will have a chronic disease. <laughs> um, one out of two people at this on conference will be considered to have a chronic disease. That's where our money in healthcare is going to go, um, and, uh, and and then you look at these other stats about you know the amount of money we spend on, and so that's that's the problem. That's uh, that's why we, we really have to change the way that we do medicine, and um, and there's you know some thoughts and you know, there's e-patient communities that are being set up to you know that we can discuss that are being set up to uh, to help move medicine forward, but but healthcare in general as an industry. Has really looked, and the federal government has looked at, at personalized health care and how personalized health care can change this. Um, and so, before we get into personalized health care, you know, does anybody have? I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear, I always like to hear impressions of what people think personalized health care means. Do you guys have, have you heard, um, or even just your personal impressions of when you hear personalized health care, what it means? On the surface level, it means I get to carry my record with me. So you, you get access to your information? And I can carry it with me and I still have to fill out 
40 forms when I go to that doctor's <laughs> office, even though I have all my mm -hmm. information with me. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? It should be transferable, too, from facility to facility, mm -hmm. depending upon where you've been. Um, I look at it also as um, your personal physician, which I know they don't have time for this now, your personal physician setting up your program of health care and being more involved in it in the preventative end of things. Mm -hmm. That's that's okay. the medical home model. So if you've heard of that, that's 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 certainly a part of it. Did you have? Did you have? Well, and, and that's pretty much what I was going to say. The medical home and having the ability to have tests done or care received based on my personal condition, not um, to to prevent lawsuits or just because this is the standard procedure mm -hmm. or. A CYA, but it's more, you know, about right. who I am, right. what I bring to the table. I guess I would say, uh, I don't know if it's personalized or the consumerism, but putting the patient back in the equation of, you know, the more that I know, the better outcome I'm going to have. Where, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, 20 years ago, it was like, well, I'm sick, but I'll, my doctor will fix me. And, yeah. you know. And that's a big. So there's a big dynamic being created right now because there is a, you know, see there's a huge rise in consumerism and consumers wanting to be a part of healthcare. Um, but, and I'll just throw this out there, what part of healthcare is currently set up to, to deal with that? I mean, and, and to a certain extent, that's, that's what I hear, is, is that, oh, that's something we have to deal with. Right. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of the attitude. probably doesn't want an educated patient because it was easier. <laughs> to well, and you're not educated. I mean, I think that, uh, that the, the pervasive attitude is that when you come in and you've gathered all this information about your disease and self diagnose and all of that, you come into the doctor's office, you're not educated, you're a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, I think that's the pervasive attitude. So personalized health care um, is, 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 is really being created by these emerging influences, systems biology. And is there any biologist or any scientist in the room that? Maybe could better identify or define what systems biology is than I. All right, I'll, I'll take a swing at it here. <laughs> Rapid digitization of medical information, which is is being mandated by the federal government, um, and kind of that portable information that you guys are talking about, and consumerism, which to a certain extent is is the medical home model and how we're going to deal with the consumers. Um, systems biology is the idea that that uh, Jody, for instance, has she's a system. The human being is a system, but each system is not is not completely separate from any other system. So you live in an environment, you have environmental factors, um, you know, the weather is a system, the, the, the things you breathe, the air you breathe, those things are a system. Your, uh, your family history is a system. Um, there are many other systems that impact who you are. And so the idea with personalized healthcare is that we're gonna be able to look at Jody because we, we can map her genome. We can look at her and we can see what her genetic basis looks like when she's genetically healthy. And so years before Jody has breast cancer, heart disease, her genes start to change and, and express proteins that are markers that say, hey, Jody's going to get or has a 95% chance of getting heart disease. Um, personalized medicine then would look at that and look at those genetic markers and be able to turn back the clock, um, reverse that process so that she never does get heart disease. So we're, we're using science to prevent chronic disease. That's the idea here. Now, um, that's not as easy as just looking at, at, at Jody's genetic makeup because um, while it's nice to know that, um, you know, that is, is that information without the context of the other systems that exist in Jody's world are, is, is, is worthless. It's, there's really no way to act on it. And one of the problems I see with healthcare the way it is right now is that we have to have a relationship in order to get some sort of accurate information from Jody. So, if Jody walks into my office for the first time, she's healthy. And, you know, if you're healthy, you see the doctor once a year. And uh, so for six minutes a year, Jody gets to see her medical provider. There's no relationship there that's going to allow Jody to share information like I smoke or how much I drink or, you know, I mean, even, you know, accurate there's information on my family history, right? There's a form. That right. you yeah, there's a form, right? Yeah, you fill out a form. So you're not even talking to the doctor about it. There's no relationship there. And, and what I contend is that for us to be able to get accurate information, and, and really be able to do this really cool science, we're gonna have to create some sort of relationship with a, with a healthcare provider. Not with a system, but with a healthcare provider that allows us to, to, uh, to, to really understand the stuff and figure it out. <coughs> so um, in comes this, this concept that, uh, that we're developing called P4 medicine, 
which uses um, a model that's predictive, preventative, participatory, and personalized. Um, you, uh, you, here's, a, here's another way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, predictive medicine is, is looking at that DNA, looking at some of that history, um, looking at the systems that, that are around you, and, uh, and, and using that as information. Um, personalized is, is your unique genetic makeup. Um, preventative really is wellness. And the participatory, participatory is more than just having access to your, to your medical records and your medical information. It's having access to it being a part of providing that information, um, you know, creating two-way conversation about that information, um, and, and, and sharing information on medical choices and direction um, with the provider. So the participatory part, I think of all these things, I think the hardest thing right now for us to create is going to be this participatory part because we're not set up to do that. Um, all of this, of course, you know, is, is it, when you talk about systems, um, is inside the system of the healthcare industry. And so your doctors don't get paid for keeping you healthy. So we got to figure that out too because ultimately the guys in the white coats are going to want to get paid. You know, and, and, and they're not getting paid right now for keeping you healthy. Um, they're getting paid based on the number of you they see, is what, it, is what it comes down to, which, as you can see, does not equal wellness. Um, and so what happens is here is tra traditionally we would get um, people who are diagnosed with heart disease. And, uh, and, and, you know, you guys talked a little bit about, you hit on this a little bit, but uh, if you have heart disease, then we'd start giving you certain kinds of blood thinners. Um, some people would, uh, would not respond to that or it would actually be toxic. Some people would respond and, uh, and, and, and we'd move on with the treatment. Um, the problem here is that, or, or one of the solutions here, is that by doing the personalized thing, um, the predictive thing, by looking at your genetic makeup, we can know, we're starting to understand um, what medicines will work and what medicines won't. Um, and so if, if we give you a regular statin, um, you know, Jody's. If, if we had in, before we gave Jody that statin, we may be able to look at her at her you know genetic makeup or DNA, and it would tell us that's not going to work, or it's going to work if you give her 400 per t you know 400 times the usual dosage. Um, that helps us understand you know those treatments, and uh, that's one of the big costs right now. So the problem again, when you look at this, and this this comes from the advisory group, which is a healthcare um, uh, think tank. You know, when I look at this model they have here, again, I really don't see the patient. I don't really see, you know, the patient and the information and the relationship that has to exist. And so that's, that's where I think our big disconnect right now is with uh, P4 Medicine. We talk about um, participatory, but, you know, what in this is, is really participatory? And I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there yet. We know that, uh, that mobile is a big part of people participating in their health care, but, uh, but we're not set up to, to do that. Um, so here's, here's where they start to talk about patient ownership. Um, you know, the personal health records, the home monitoring devices, um, genetic savvy. But <laughs> again, I mean, when you talk about patient ownership, I think you have to look at, at mobile. Um, you know, and it doesn't exist here. You know, we know that people who use Facebook, just look at Facebook. Let's not even look at, at, health, at the healthcare model. People who use Facebook on their handheld, um, you know, spend like 50% more time doing it and inter interact with dozens more people. So why aren't we translating that to, uh, to, this, to this model? It doesn't mean that people have to talk about, you know, what's wrong with them or, or their, you know, their, their sickness. But if that's not what we focus on, if instead we're focusing on their wellness, then, you know, can't we, can't we do that? Um, and I think that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the ways we're going to have to go. The fact is that 61, and this is according to the, the Pew um, Internet, uh, uh, the Pew Foundation, 61% of adults look for their information online, um, and 60% you know, of those e-patients are, are going through user-generated content to, to understand what, what, other people, what other people want from them. So this ecosystem, this con these consumers, um, are really uh, driving this on their own, and we're absent from the conversation. When I say we, I mean healthcare professionals are absent from this conversation um, because we've built walls that say no, we're professionals. We can't. We can't have conversations outside of, you know, the office. Um, and because of that, these things are happening, and and we're not a part of the conversation. But how are you defining the e-patients? Uh, in this in this case, it's it's people who participate in conversations 
about their health online. Okay. So they do, and, and I, don't, I don't have this um, on here. I can grab it for you real quick when we're done. Um, but there's, you know, participating in blogs, um, commenting on health information. I mean, there's, there's a dozen different identifiers that would, that would make you a new patient. And that last one, 3% been harmed by getting incorrect information, or is that what we're saying there? Or um, they, they or someone they know has been harmed, um, yes. And, and it's, so there's differing levels of harm, and they, they separate it out as far as demographics. So it's either bad information or, you know, you know it, it wasn't clear from the research, you know, why okay. they were harmed. Um, but it was clear that... Uh, that the online um, information or the e-patient is no more at risk for being harmed than you know than anyone else who looks for health information online. So the doctors who uh, who are really concerned about patients um, getting this information and being you know being tainted or being harmed by by gathering this information on their own, the fact is it hasn't changed at all. Is is I think the the really important piece there, um, you know. Oh my God! Facebook is going to kill people because they're going to, you know, or Twitter is going to kill people because they get. And there was recently a study put out about all the misinformation that goes into that. The fact remains that it isn't harming people. Mm -hmm. It's just more information that people are able to, you know, to, to go through and, and, and decide how it affects them. And harm includes a stomach ache to fatal. Yeah, I, you know, you, you have to think that it's probably. Yeah, you have to think that it's all of them. You know, I don't. Again, I, I don't know how that was defined. We'd have to go into the research. And is that really kind of talking about the fact that your neighborhood just got bigger? I mean, I'm looking at that and I think to myself, okay, I have a stomach ache or my knee hurts and I'm in the backyard, you know, mowing the lawn and I'm talking to my neighbor Joe and he says, oh yeah, I had that knee problem. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. And I put this, you know, ointment on it or I mm -hmm. took an ibuprofen or this, that, and the other thing. To me, Twitter and Facebook and, and so many of these other social networks are just an expansion of the guy that I talk to in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say you've got X problem, they give you Y solution, you filter it through what you think you know and you decide that's crazy or that might make some sense and you kind of right. go with it. So in order of, along with this research, in order of the way that patients <coughs> rate the health information they get, 80% say number one is, is a healthcare provider or physician who aren't here. Um, and then the next closest one is family or friends. Um, and what that and, and what that tells me, and it, it doesn't say family or friends online, it just says family or friends. Number three then is online resources. Um, so in, in the way they rank the information they get. Um, and then there's, I think there's a dozen of them, but those are the top three. And more and more, the way we interact with family and friends is online. So I, that's just going to grow. I think uh, radio and TV is number four. And uh, three and four have been vying for position mm -hmm. for a number of years now, at least in, in some of the studies. Yeah. Well, yeah. I would say that the fact that 61% of people now are going online, mm -hmm. and because your online interaction now includes that family and friends, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, would, I would say that that will, will soon start to rival number one, which is interaction with the physician, especially if that interaction with the physician doesn't turn to this online model and doesn't start looking at how to become a part of this conversation. And, and I don't think they need to compete. I think in the P4 model, maybe one of the solutions to this ridiculous healthcare system we've built, I think that, uh, that, that in fact they have to collaborate yeah. mm -hmm. to, to move forward. Um, we know that this was part of that research that mobile drives uh, presentation or, or or participa participation because they're always on. They're using, you know, they're, they're more savvy in general about about uh, the internet. <clears throat> and so this is this is where I come to with with what we're doing as far as social media is that you have to start by listening. I don't think that uh, in the doctor's offices. I don't think we're even at this very <laughs> foundational level yet. I think we're we're hearing still. You know, your mom told you the difference between listening and hearing. I think we're still hearing a lot. Um, and, and from there, we can respond and influence um, the, the health of people. But I think that um, as much as we can then influence, we being providers, influence what patients are doing, I think the patients are able to influence us as well. I think that's, that's where we, we get participatory medicine. And, uh, and, and then we're able to enlist people in, in, in being able to you know, predict and prevent 
and they can participate. Um, this, by the way, is also the model um, I use for every single one of our social media interactions. It's the same exact thing. So when I look at how it could work, to me this says, you know, we can use those tools to do the same exact thing. If they have an outcome, it's the same exact thing. Which is why our, kind of our direction has gone away from let's use Facebook and Twitter and more towards how do we do this to, to create better medicine and create better healthcare. And, and it, you move up the pyramid mm -hmm. in this process? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can't, you know, you can't respond without listening. Well, we do. I mean, that's, and that's that's been the problem is that we uh, we react. You know, when you start when you start with responding instead of listening, then you have reactive medicine. So that's kind of where we're at, and I, I guess my argument is that, you know, this has, you know, this this entire model um, and moving it forward is social social by nature. But what I struggle with is. How interested are patients? How how um, how do we get them interested? Because we built so many walls and so many barriers for <coughs> years and years, um, you know, to that participate participation in your health. Um, that uh, that I'm not sure how to go about even getting started. That's which is why I come to you. <laughs> well, to I would say I would much rather pay for somebody to keep me well or to prevent me from getting the disease. I've gotten the disease. Mm -hmm. So thinking in a whole different model instead of reactive but proactive. Um, if I had an outlet to go to or a resource to go to and it was always open and not um, 8 to 5 or 9 to 4, I have to visit here and there. And I'm, if I had a more inclusive um, resource to go to, I would participate more. I hate trying to make an appointment to go to the doctor. You know, it's just for me or my family. <laughs> but it's just a process you have to go through. But so I know there's concierge models or concierge medicine, and I don't know yeah. who's looked at that um, to try and break down some of those pain points. But there are some health providers who argue that the dawn of concierge medicine will actually mean um, worse health because fewer people will have, there'll be, there isn't enough doctors to be able to focus like that. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Well, and the employers have ended up being sort of a de facto medical home because they're paying the insurance premiums. So now they're offering the wellness, you know, the health assessments and things, but do you want to be answering all these personal questions that somebody within your organization has access to? So. If that could go back to, you know, where you're sharing that information with your medical provider, that's going to be a more appropriate place for that. But it's, it, you know, it's really kind of a sticky situation right now because are people being honest on their health assessment? Because, you know, why do you want to share that with your employer or your employer's health Somebody. insurance company? I mean, that's the thing. Right. It's like if you can be excluded for pre-existing con yeah. conditions, you're not going to say, my family has a history of diabetes. It's so, not even excluded. It's, I mean, the fact that I smoke may, may make the difference between yeah. affordable health care, you know, with my particular employer and, and unaffordable. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, your cost is yeah. based on things like that. Um, you know, so how do, we, how do we change that? I think Donald? another part of that kind of like information exchange is definitely a transportable record that goes wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Because right now, the way our system creates is, is everybody that you interact with has a record on you, and those records don't interact. Mm -hmm. So you are constantly answering the same questions over and over again. Um, and that eats up a big part of the physician interaction time, too. The first time you go into somebody, they're asking you a series of questions that you have already answered many, many, many times. And I think people start to phase out mm -hmm. to where it's like they just gloss through that information. So if you had that transportable record with you that every physician that you interact with could work with, it would save everybody time. You'd actually have better information to work with. And so that physician could basically review what's in there and say, all right, this is your historical record. These are things that you've changed. Is there anything that's changed in here? What can we focus on and make it better for you? I think another thing, too, for the concierge kind of like approach is, yeah, there's not enough doctors to make that work. And also many, especially family practice doctors, are just no longer interested in doing that type of medicine. Many of the doctors that I speak with and work with and recruit, 
are telling me it's like, well, when I look at the total number of hours that I work to what I pay, you know, I'm paid, you know, I'm not, why did I go to medical school? You know, so it, it, part of it's going to be, I think, creating guides that can get that initial information from you and be your advocate and then basically figure out where you go from there. So like nurse practitioners, allied health services, that may be your first encounter in the medical system, which we already experienced that anyway. You go to a doctor's office, you're having very little physician time, you're having a lot of nurse time, and the doctor is basically coming in to ask you a couple questions for liability reasons and say, okay, take these medications, and you know, you may, you may never see that doctor right. again. But for those other professions, you actually may have the ability to have an ongoing relationship with one person, and all you know. I think that the mm -hmm. trust and communication comes from that, so that's a possibility. But even there, we're assuming that there's already a problem, right. and you're there because there's a problem. And so, how we back that up and get you into that system before? Right. Well, are we going to? Is is as a, we look forward and determine that we've got to change a bunch of stuff. Are we going to be able to kind of? take a step back and look at how this kind of all, you know, where it came from and, and how it's it's gotten here. I mean, I think we are starting to graduate away from needing doctors and you're spending more time with physician assistants and different kinds of nurses and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then you just kind of, you go to a specialist when you absolutely have mm -hmm. to go to a specialist and there's no listening there because you only get three and a half minutes with them anyway. Yeah. And so it's gotta be quick. But if you, if you really take that step back and say, okay, you know, where did health insurance start and come from? You know, what it, what is it that we were doing that, you know, brought this all kind of on and and whose responsibility is it? I mean, that that's the one thing that, that I, I agree 100% with prevention and everything else, but I don't think we've taken a good enough step back to say we've got a significant <coughs> responsibility into our personal health care before leaning on our companies and our medical providers and, and everybody else, which is what we have seemed to kind of grown into. And, and I, I, from what I've read and, and what I've seen, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, we started getting into health insurance because we needed to make sure that our factory workers could work. And so we said, okay, in order to keep our factory workers working, right. we need to make sure that they're healthy. And that's where we started saying, okay, we're going to pay for all this. We're going to make sure that you can keep producing what we need you to produce. Well, we, we haven't necessarily gotten away from that, even though we don't need factory workers producing. And it's, as you've shown in, in the charts, it's gone down with, you know, all of those those factors and, and those influences. So if we are getting the ability, this, you know, unique opportunity to change some things, I think we have to step back and, and start getting away from everybody saying it's somebody else's responsibility. Because I think we have a tendency to do that too much whether it's on purpose, consciously, or, or whatever, we, we have this tendency to say, you know, my company is responsible for this, or I can't do it because my insurance, you know, is too expensive. Yet, I think if a lot of people looked at what they were spending per month in going out to eat at a restaurant versus what they're spending per month for their own, you know, health care and well-being and exercise and diet, because it's... There isn't a whole lot of stuff that we don't understand or, or know, but it's it's a matter of what we do, and then we go back to, to saying it's it's somebody else's responsibility. So, how do we how do we take advantage of this to make everybody take a step back? Because I don't know how much prevention is necessarily medical. I mean, to me, prevention and quality of life and all that other stuff is not. To me, doctors and, and nurses and hospitals and everything else that's. When you hit the wall and, right. and you need <laughs> somebody to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to pull you out. All this other stuff, I think, is counselors and, right. and personal trainers and, right. you know, nutritionists and, mm -hmm. and, I mean, and mental health and, and all that other stuff. And you, you, I think we are, too. We're starting to get that from a number of different places before you fall back into. Right, and I think that, you know, there's an absolute disconnect between so the, the physician or, or any particular person who would be coordinating your health, you know, we don't, that doesn't exist right now. And, mm -hmm. and if it did, we would have an understanding that, okay, Chris, you have the right things in place. You have a trainer. You're, you're doing the right things to keep yourself healthy based on, you know, maybe some of these genetic risk factors or other things that we understand that you have. Um, so how do you get someone, how do you, because I, I think there's got to be some sort of incentive. So mm -hmm. Clay Marsh, who is in charge of, of personalized healthcare thing at Ohio State um, likes to talk about how <clears throat> the old model is a is an airplane model and uh, and it's a it's a 
uh, pilot-centered um, flight. So the pilot's the most important person on the plane. And if the pilot dies or goes away, the plane's going to crash. Um, and so we focus everything on the pilot, which in healthcare is the physician. Um, and, and he wants to step back and take a look, okay, let's look at the passengers and let's do everything we can, focus all our resources on, on getting them to where they need to go. But I, I guess my question is, you know, in the old model, you're on the plane because you're sick, because you hit the wall already, you need to get somewhere to get healthy again. In the new model, why are you getting on the plane? You know, and is there any sort of incentive to, to get on that plane? And I, I don't know, because I, I mean, I mean, even personally, looking at, you know, to, to taking a step back and looking at it personally, um, you know, outside of, you know, extending my life, but it, for whatever reason, doesn't seem like that's always enough for people. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of the healthcare um, <coughs> health savings account where, you know, if I, and I have a high deductible plan, so it's like, I'm probably not going to dip into my insurance unless I go over $2,000. So if I'm careful and, and plan my health care expenditures, I get the remainder of that $2,000 left that rolls over to the next year. So it becomes like a bonus for staying healthy where, you know, if your employer is paying your health insurance, it's like, you know, I might as well, you know, use my visits because somebody's paying for it. So it, it, it becomes more of a, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. you get a you get a bonus for staying healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I like those plans because then, you know, you see what things really cost and not what the... But the how, how many people crew. won't go to their annual physicals or go in when they've got strep or anything else because they're trying to save that money. Well, some catastrophe that I like guess that's the, the piece where you learn, well, there's times where you go to the doctor and it's worth my investment. I, you know, I don't know. Also, the new plans are supposed to have first dollar for preventative care, so it's not going into my deductible at all, so it's worth it to get your preventative checks. I, you know, I don't know. And maybe it's one of the problems is that we've never really structure. defined what health is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or what you care. are when you're healthy. Yeah. I mean, it's mm -hmm. all disease care. And, uh, and so, I mean, to your point, Chris, I mean, the, the idea there is that, that the only time I use medical, true medical, you know, resources is when I'm sick. Um, and, and, you know, is there an opportunity, I mean, from an industry standpoint, but also from a health standpoint, to be involved? I mean, I think that the, the, what we're saying here is to truly be healthy, you know, we have to be more involved with the medical field up front. I mean, some people are able to coordinate the trainers and the dietitians and, you know, and all that stuff on their own, but, you know, what about the rest of us who have no idea where to start? But is that our responsibility? I mean, we're, we're working a lot on, on policy and, and on all those things, and, and ultimately I think that will have a whole lot to do with how things do get changed, but I guess I'm, I'm it bothers me that we're not looking at ourselves as being primarily responsible for our own health. We keep we keep pointing fingers at companies and insurance and doctors and government. And I think that's you know, I, I'm not I'm not discounting what we need to do to, to make that more streamlined, but but we haven't spent a whole lot of time saying what our responsibilities are. So who does that? Who I mean is that the government that, right? is that the <laughs> government who, who says, look, you're gonna be responsible now? Yeah. Well, well, I, yeah, I mean, let's, let's just bring it back to public media for a second. Um, it, one of the advantages public media has in this conversation is that we have this very high trust level with our audience. So unlike watching Channel 4, uh, NBC or ABC, where it's a uh, drug company ad every, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. we don't have drug company ads. So how, how can, um, you know, the Ohio States cultivate public media and, and use them to help start this conversation? I help get it going. I, I think that's a question in my mind. Um, this is a good opportunity. Yeah. I mean, are you using public media now, or uh, you know, you have a public television licensee? Right. Um, or yeah, is, or is, is, or, or the or answer is no. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, it, again, as an industry, I mean, you know, we look at uh, our doctors and, and our physicians and our researchers, and we say, okay, they should be in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that's where that conversation belongs. Um, you know, public media represents patients to a certain extent and again we talk about the disconnect between you know the our audience is full of doctors and nurses well and right yeah right yeah, but, but but they're not connecting with the patients you know or or with consumers mm -hmm. um and and there's been no there's been no interest in in people as consumers well, I, I mean some of the public 
health projects we've worked with where we've worked with public health docs, one thing they told us is sometimes you have to go in through the back door. If you want to change the system, sometimes you have to put pressure on the providers mm -hmm. by going to the patients, the clients, mm -hmm. <laughs> and changing their attitudes. So they, when they come to your office, they say, you know, I really want you to talk to me about prevention mm -hmm. because I, I've been hearing this is important. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and um, so some of these public media campaigns, everything from billboards to messaging on to, in talk shows to all kinds of things, can, can, change, can, can get the message to your professional audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, how do, you, how do you want to sneak through the back door? What do you want to say? You know, what are, what are the real important issues to start bringing up? You know, for the docs, for example, mm -hmm. um, to get them to be more responsive. And, and it sounds like one of them is this issue about listening. <laughs> well, because, I mean, yeah. to Chris's point over here, when yeah. uh, when a patient walks in and they've done some of this stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the physician looks at him and says, really? No, I'm the doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. well, okay, it's, so like, it's like our last conversation between experts and amateurs. And that's what I was going to say. My mm -hmm. great grandmother mm -hmm. lived to be 98 years old. My grandmother lived to be 96 years old. They're experts, in, in my opinion. If I get ill, I'd rather call my grandmother and say, hey, this is this. And if it, I, once I filter it in today's times and my lifestyle and everything, I would follow her advice um, probably before going to a physician. Or I would do both. But I think sometimes we we've gotten away from taking ownership mm -hmm. of what are practical um, methods before automatically just going to the doctor for expertise. Mm -hmm. And who do we look at as ex experts and amateurs and, and where's that bridge and how do the amateurs get their voice out mm -hmm. or experts or whatever, however you want to yeah. be other non-doctors. Well, I mean, just as an example, I mean, for, for years and years, the pharmacist has been a source of medical advice to right. low-income people and to, and to people without insurance. And, uh, you know, I think even even the medical profession recognizes that. <laughs> and they, they respect it. You know, there's a level of respect. That, well, okay, you know, a lot of the pharmacist does deliver a lot of information. And I, I think that's what's yeah. not forbidden there, though, is mm -hmm. our society has changed. And it used to be that you were in a community where you had your neighborhood pharmacist, mm -hmm. and you interacted with that pharmacist all the time. You knew that person; time. they knew okay. you, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like Mr. Gower from "It's a Wonderful Life." You know, mm -hmm. you, and all, he served you for other needs. Yeah. You weren't always there getting medicine; you're there getting other things. That's changed. I mean, think about the pharmacies that you go to now. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing it? I typically see a different person every time that I go in, mm -hmm. so I don't have that connection or that relationship. Well, and there's so, 20 right. in two blocks of your house. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is where I come back to right. each and every time, is that although we've made, you know, wide advances in medicine, um, we've completely lost that interaction, that relationship right. with, uh, with the people who need to be able to understand that information. Right. And so, you know, we haven't seen significant increases in, in expect, you know, life expectation and have, have seen actually, you know, more people becoming, you know, you know, diseased um, mm -hmm. in, in, with these diseases. And so I think, how do we, I think an el a big element of all of this is how do we create that relationship again? How do we do that? And that relationship also gives you the accountability too. If you're dealing with somebody over the course of time, if you don't follow through on what your personal responsibility is for probably that healthcare plan, you know, it's a different deal. And it's like, oh, it's, it's dealing with some anonymous person. You know, one possible way maybe to grow this is the best way to get buy-in from people or to have success stories and like like here's an example of somebody that's done this and has gone through and part of that might be a partnership so like you know you've got this connection to a gigantic student community at OSU maybe part of being an OSU student is like well you know you get certain coverage as being a student you become part of this personalized medicine program so during your four five or six or how many years you're an undergrad or grad school or something like that you are part of this program and that, especially because of the age that you're getting these kids at, you are training them to kind of buy into this personalized medicine model because they they don't have any other comparison points. Like, all right, you know, as a student, this is what I did. I had my you know 
yearly exam, I had my health coach or whatever, you know, something of that, and you kind of grow it over time. It takes a lot of patience and you wouldn't see the true results of that for many, many years. You know, the possibilities maybe find an organization or a community in Columbus and or some type of organization say, hey, all my employees are going to do this and we're going to commit to X amount of years to see what happens, or find some underserved community in Columbus to, for those folks that don't have a direct connection to healthcare and let those people kind of be your role models, like, hey, here's a group of people that didn't have access to healthcare, didn't have that education, training, role modeling, whatever, to know or to buy into that it was important. And then over the course of years, you have those success stories, and those people then become the people that, by just what happened to them, help you grow it out within the community. What would it take for you guys, I mean, just the people in this room, to to feel like you had that relationship with the provider? What, what would it take? Being able to interact digitally, you know? I mean, it doesn't even have to be my, my primary care physician, but just that I'm recording information and, and we're having an ongoing conversation and yeah, it's like so cumbersome right now to do these 10 sheets of paper or whatever that, you know, it, 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 you know, you could, your health history, you your can, health history. You can make exactly. your health history make your health inter history interactive and you would be able to on an ongoing basis without having a doctor's appointment without yeah. being prompted go in and update your health record mm -hmm. and then you might get occasional reminders of like hey you know is there, has there anything gone on in your life in the last six months mm -hmm. that you need to update for your health record mm -hmm. knowing that by doing that you would save yourself time in every additional interaction that you mm -hmm. had and then you could also do things for like doctor's appointments and things like that in addition to your paper appointment card, you get like a text message. It's mm -hmm. like the day before, mm -hmm. day of, you know, that creates some of that interactive right. relationship. Yeah. So one of, one of the things we're doing, we have, um, at Ohio State, we have your plan for health, which right. is actually a health care um, you know, plan and mm -hmm. fair. And, uh, and, and they incent you by, you know, by entering that information in right. and keeping that information up to date, you know, you get $20 a month off your health insurance, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of that right. incentive. But I still don't see yet in there Does where your doctor access that. Yeah, though? that's the thing. Is okay. I, I still don't see in there where where it's created any kind of relationship. Right. I mean, I have a relationship with the computer program, um, but not with the people that you know supposedly care about my health. Right. Does well, anybody have an electronic health record in here? What or do you mean have one? Well, we don't either know. Like a personal <laughs> health record or. Yeah, there's sort of like two, there's Access. like the Google Health where you can load your own information or there's, you know, having your information digitally accessed through either your doctor or your health insurance company. And there was a good article, this coming tsunami of digital health IT yeah. because the funding is coming through, but it's going to be a complete paradigm shift. I mean, HIPAA really needs to be recreated for the digital world because yeah, it doesn't work right now. was designed for digital yeah. and I work with that literally every day yeah. for my job. So the model, the current model that people are kind of looking towards the Cleveland Clinic where they are actually mm -hmm. creating that transportable health record for their mm -hmm. patients. Basically, once you come into the system, you have to maintain that. But they're struggling with that in a lot of ways and it's a very, you know, Cleveland Clinic has gone from one site to multiple sites and integrating all that's a challenge. But you know, that's kind of what everybody's striving for. And then the, the U.S. government with the health care reform has a lot of funding and grants linked to going electronic. Um, and a lot of people actually are deferring decisions about making that to look like. I want to know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I What's don't want to make that jump. Format? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I want to see what the format's going to be. And also, I think yeah. I want to wait until I know what yeah. funding's out there for me to mm -hmm. grab because I don't want to pay for it myself. So it's an interesting time. Everybody kind of like knows that they need to do it. But they're not taking that jump yet. And that's not new. I, yeah. I was in electronic health care records for eight years until I just got exhausted and, mm -hmm. and moved on. <laughs> and, you know, we used to have those conversations. I mean, I, I would I would speak at national conferences, and that was always right. the question. Go on, what then? Right. Uh -huh. And my response was, you're, you're two years ahead of everybody else. Right. You know, uh -huh. there's a thousand questions that you're not going to know to ask until you get involved in this. Exactly. And, and Two years of your prep work has nothing to do with the software you're going to select mm -hmm. that's going to make you electronic in the first place. Right, because mm -hmm. you're still doing all those business process questions oh, yeah. and all that yeah. stuff mm -hmm. that no matter what you do, you still have to address. Yeah. 
you still have all your paper records that you're going to have to do something with, mm -hmm. scan them or do some type of index. Yeah. And that whatever. whole, that whole that again, in system situation. is so antiquated and right. so disproportionate mm -hmm. to the amount of workload that's coming in. And so nothing talks to anything. I do have my electronic health care record from my primary physician. And she uses, she uses a, a tablet when you walk into the exam room. And if she's got to type out a note, she puts it in. I, I love all that stuff, but to try to get documents to her and try to get documents out right. of her is the is it, it's a Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah. I can send the you know medical assistant an email that has blood work or a bunch of information that she needs to have, and they will literally have to print it out and scan it back into their system. Right. Mm -hmm. They have to take an electronic <laughs> document from me, right. print it out, make it electronic again to put it in and attach because it with, of HIPAA, with the system. Because of the privacy situation. Part part of it is that. The other part of it is, is the way the system's yeah. built. The yeah. system and, and when I wanted my electronic health care record, they had to literally print it out for me. <laughs> right. They could not give me a disc. They had to print out a 750 page medical record right. that I had to scan back yeah. in. Just happened to my to wife my and, they, and they sent us a bill for $75. Mm -hmm. right. For the printing. Right. And that's because yeah. a lot of those records are in different formats, right. created yeah. by different systems, There's but no different practices PDF that use different type of uh, formats. But that's, I mean, that's what he's saying. Yeah, Basically, portable's kind you of a take funny term, I think. Become, yeah. Yeah, it's you, you, you know, you can't mentioned, read the yeah. field. You mentioned getting reminders, right. appreciating getting reminders and, and use of text messages. I've seen some research uh, about text messaging from nurses and doctors to uh, teenage patients, in this case, asthma, kids with asthma. Uh, this is coming out of Cincinnati Children's hospital and uh, it, it shows that they're very effective as far as reminding teenagers right. to take their meds and they're pretty short messages but the fact that they're daily according to the clients makes a whole lot of difference and the fact that they're coming from a person yeah. they're coming right. from that nurse at children's yeah. and, and and these teenagers say you know I just I really like getting that reminder from my nurse mm -hmm. and and why did they start doing this because they found when the teenagers came into the clinic it was hard to get their attention because they're using the phone and yeah. they're texting. Exactly. And, uh, sure. and she, she said, you know, sometimes you just got to get in their face to, to really get their attention. And she, so they started to use the phone mm -hmm. now as, as a, a personal connector, reminder kind mm -hmm. of tool. It ain't that expensive, right. I don't mm -hmm. think. Now, it's a pilot program. HIPAA comes into right. it, I think. But I, talking about something that seems to get a, a really warm response, from from clients that so that's one, yeah. Again, that, that the mobile element of that and it, it's so personal. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, your phone is so right. personal. Right. Um, okay. But are you willing to share health information on your phone? So it's one thing to get a text message mm -hmm. to say, hey, don't forget to you know to yes. use your inhaler or to take your steroids or whatever. It's completely different um, when you have to send the information back or you have to input the information um, into a medical record from your phone. I mean, I don't know. It, yeah, it's not, it's people not considered a secure transmission yeah. source, so there are people, certain types of records you wouldn't be able to send back and forth. And there are people the concerned about, right. <clears throat> about, you know, if I go on the computer, I'm fine, you know, putting in my, yeah. my, my biomarkers, my, my cholesterol levels and all that stuff, but am I really going to put it in my phone? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think know. that's going to be real interesting because two years ago, and actually that's part of my talk on, on search engine optimization, two years ago, you know, we were freaking out when anybody said anything about our healthcare records and, and it was leaking that certain markers were getting you dinged on your insurance and you wouldn't be covered for this, that, and the other thing. And, and that would shut the doors on everything. And, and you know, if you would ask me a year ago, I'd have said the same thing, but, but it, 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 when I go through my talk, it's going through, you know, when, when Microsoft came out and wanted our information, we were ready to burn to the ground. When mm -hmm. Google came out and said, we have your information, <laughs> we were ready to burn them to the ground. Right. When Facebook comes out and says, we have all your information, we're giving it to everybody that we know, we're giving it to everybody that they know, that they know, <laughs> that they know, that they know, we sign up by 100 million users an hour. So, you know, from last year, from too. last year, yes and no, privacy. Facebook doesn't... Facebook can't yeah. grow to 400 million users by being No, but I'm saying only. the new version of what's private is right, right. You know, people share, here, I'm having my period, I, or whatever. I, 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 that I an older generation, yeah. you know, keeps... I, I, I guess the idea yeah. would be that if my health information is out there, 
what's the big deal? But that's you know, what I think has changed so in the last, even the last year. Right now. Whereas, again, I think two years ago to 200 years ago, it was, no, you can't have my stuff. It's my stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to know because what you're going to do with it is going to be bad for me. Right. Up until this last year where where everything's gone so social and we're so overwhelmed by it. Our generations are overwhelmed by it because we used to be the no, you can't have it. Right. And the new generation of, I don't care if you have it. Right. Who cares if you have it? What are you going to do if you have right. this information? I can do anything. And it's coming at you so fast, yeah. it doesn't make any difference. That's a, a very significant question. Because I, I would have never thought about that. How is that going to change privacy right. in, in health care? I mean, are we going to say, we don't care about anything else. Yeah. You can have all my other data mm -hmm. because you already have it anyway. Yeah. But healthcare, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be private about that. Because yeah. okay. what I'd argue is that Facebook has better information about your health mm -hmm. than your physicians, mm -hmm. than right. your physicians, your mm -hmm. nurses. I agree. Your I absolutely agree. And again, we we are. I don't want to say we're going willing, but we are certainly not putting up a fight. Mm -hmm. Well, people are willing to waive their right to privacy if there is, you know, some Convenience. benefit. It's like. You know, okay, if I have this disease and I share my information and now I get to connect with other people with the same disease, there's something in it for me. So it's it's almost like, yeah, it's been, it's been one-sided for so long that now, you know. And if I know that it's not going to be used against you. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah. the big thing. But, but, but again, I don't know. Again, it's almost coming too fast. That it, it I think if, you know, it's like I just see this one person, you know, trying to hold back a million others. <laughs> <laughs> and and I and I mean that's just the visualization that I get, you know, one person going like this and a million people running over them, and I and I see that as that person being the I'm going to use this, this information against you because you've just got you, you've just got these screams going. No, you're not because if you do, we're going to kill you. <laughs> well, you know, the wellness and prevention messages though aren't um, covered by HIPAA. They aren't really so so unique to the individual, and yet they're profoundly important. Um, I mean, with asthma, you know, watch watch the weather reports, see what the air quality level mm -hmm. is today. That's all public information. Right. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, you know, the healthcare folks don't use it <laughs> to a large extent. Public television, we're starting to use it a little bit, mm -hmm. and we're using the, uh, the air quality reports with, with this group of uh, folks we work with with asthma. But um, uh, now, we're, are we doctors? No, we're kind of doctor and nurses helpers mm -hmm. <laughs> at this health point. Educators. Yeah, we're health yeah. educators. But but here again, the, the information is public already, and we're just channeling it in a little different way. But um, it's not really so different from that text message that right. was getting mm -hmm. sent to the teenager. We could be exactly. doing, sending text messages to teenagers too and, and uh, creating some sort of benefit out of it. Community Behavioral Health Centers have been using it for the last couple of years. They have because yeah. they, I mean, they're they're using it for for dual purposes. It it, it reduces their no-show rates, and and unfortunately, the way that medicine works now, you you got to have that hour to get paid. Right. So it's a reminder so it, to it, come it, to your appointment. It's a reminder appointment. to come to the appointment, but especially low income, low income have cell phones, not computers. Right. And that they and also so that's they have their cell phone with them. Their all addresses the change as well. Right. 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 Regular. Right standard landline phone numbers change a lot or lose service, the cell phone is the kind of that, that unique thing that's transportable and does not go away. And part of this uh, Pew Research, Internet Life Research report that they did, said, um, talked a bit about the gap between, between, so, you know, Caucasians have a certain um, access to the Internet, you know, compared to African Americans. Um, but when you take mobile and inject it into the right. picture, um, some... 50 or 60 percent of African Americans are accessing the internet, and when and when you take mobile and inject it into the picture, it becomes equal. Access yeah. to the internet actually becomes equal because there's so much more adoption in the African American community right. with mobile. And Same so, for the Latino and Somali right. populations, right. Columbus and, too specifically. And so, you know, not taking that into consideration creates a divide between right. the haves and have-nots as far as you know some of this information, getting in the information, right. and, and and that. So that's so far off the radar. <laughs> but yeah. but again, you're saying the reason that doctors and nurses aren't using it is because they can't get paid. If, if they I think that's send out the so. I right. think I think the first thing they say is because I'm going to get sued. Right. First thing they say is because it's dangerous. I'm going to get sued because of HIPAA. Right. Um, but I think that 
I think there's ways around that. I mean, the children's, you know, Cincinnati Children's example is, is an example of a way around that. Um, you know, that's, that's why I exist in my organization, to look for ways to get around that. Um, I think when you get right down to it, then the, the answer becomes, well, how am I going to get paid for, for this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, I mean, so, you know, I, I have to ride both sides of that fence because, you know, I work with these guys and, and gals, and, and they should get paid for keeping us healthy or making us better. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, a lawyer wouldn't expect to, to give away, you know, information that keeps you from, you know, from getting sued. Um, you know, and, and that's really what we're doing here. But of course, it, you know, at a, at a university medical center, you can write grants. That is a form of getting paid. It's bringing in money. Mm -hmm. You can um, enhance reputation through research. That's a form of getting paid because it elevates your institution. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, you have some options there in a, right. in a university medical center that somebody in a, exactly. a family practice by themselves in a rural area wouldn't have, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you can use them. Right. And I, I think use them. Effectively. I think we're doing that, but I think to to really get adoption, we have to create a model that's viable, um, as Outside. viable in Columbus as it is in Marysville and Chillicothe, and mm -hmm. you know in Bell Fountain. I think you know I don't think it's enough, um, and I don't think it's responsible, quite honestly, to to create a piece of medicine that we can only give you at Ohio State and you can't get um, anywhere else. I, I think, and I think that that our physicians agree about that. I think you know it has to be a model that we can that we can give to anybody. Scaled. Otherwise, why are we wasting our time on it? Mm -hmm. so, so, Ryan, I'm curious. Going back to the public media thing, um, what what types of content are you creating right now that that you know that you're really excited about? That's you know helping you do better in your job. Right. Well, that's 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 the big um, wall that I come up against. So, um, you know, I can create content all day long, but I'm a social media guy in healthcare. So the content I create is about this kind of stuff. Um, I'm not necessarily a physician or a nurse, and I think that one of my jobs is to teach them how to create that content that helps connect mm -hmm. people to health information. Because I'm not a provider. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an amateur when it comes to that. Um, they're the experts, and I think that, that we've got to get them connected to those people. And that's, that's why I ask, you know, how, how do we get you know, that dynamic of the patients demanding it? Because I'm not sure that, that we're going to be providing it to them until they demand it. I just don't know that we're gonna that we're gonna do that. With that said, um, you know, I I think that, that that the patients are ready to go. You know, I think they want access, they want their records, they want health information, they want mobile. Um, and and I don't think that that as a business, even at Ohio State as a business, I don't think we've set up a, a social business design that would allow us to to uh, to react to that. So are we gonna see a bunch of aggregators come out and, and basically just surround OSU Med and say, okay, whatever the patients want, we're gonna be able to give them. That's what's happening now. Work, and they'll work as intermediaries between the data at the, at the Med Center and-, and that's, what, uh, that's what's happening now. So you have um, like the Coriel Institute and, uh, and, and uh, patients like me and uh, uh, was it 23andMe, mm -hmm. um, they're the ones gathering this genetic information. So those inter inter intermediaries are already being created at the genetic level, um, and we're, we have to, to interface with them to get information about our patients, right. which is silly. I mean, it's silly. It's, you know, we have to interface with drug companies uh, and insurance companies to get, you know, to get that information about our patients because we've not ever built a model that interfaces directly with them because that's not professional. Yeah. Why well, I, I think telling your success stories in the social media right. and medicine realm would be really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, the one I mentioned of Cincinnati Children's, I didn't read about that in the media, I, I read, a, I found out about it on Social Bright mm -hmm. because it was a case that they had there of, of um, you know, effective use of social media and medicine. So it's not, the story is not being told. I'm right. sure you've got some of the same kind of stories, yeah. but people need to hear about them. Public media folks need to hear about them so they can write about them, they can yeah. invite you to be on their shows. And it's just not sexy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, channel 10 and channel 6 and channel well, 4 are surgery, knocking on our door. If it's the, surgery, it always the, is. The, so. uh, you know, nightly news isn't knocking, I mean, you know, no one from CNN is calling me, right. you know, to, 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 hey, let's talk about this. Well, well, find them in the sexy areas. Yeah. I mean, you know, find it in surgeries. Find it, you know, go there mm -hmm. first and find it. Good. I think also during the transition you have opportunities to tell other stories just to get people accustomed to listening. Like, I think just short things about, like, this is why I became a nurse. This is why I became a doctor. This is why I'm passionate about medicine. I agree. This is why I believe in personalized medicine. This is why I specifically want to be at OSU. You know, 
throw in some of those stories from there too that are just personal whatever I think would allow you to connect to some people and then shoot some of those other messages out too and allow well, and empower the patients to talk exactly. about it's like, those oh, relationships I, with their providers as well right and, and this is why I like my doctor together. We were chatting one at the, the state of the mm -hmm. med center, but your ideas about you know engaging the patient, it's hard for them to even know like where to park and which entrance to come in and how to. So even just you know having something right. that it gives them GPS, you know, it, how to get to your doctor's office, or you know like you said, uh, using the social media as the quick the customer survey, so that you can address. It, like I think you gave the example of somebody was in a hospital room and they were complaining about something and it's like the hospital has the chance to actually go in and address that right then instead of after they get home and then they, you know, yeah, so their health it's and yeah. stress and, 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 and yeah, that text so message that you send as the appointment reminder, the you yeah. still have characters left that you can give some other helpful information. Like reminders like, oh, by the way, you know, here's a traffic thing that may affect you getting to your appointment mm -hmm. or here's a parking map if you have the ability to grab this link. A good example, a friend of mine was actually trapped in the uh, Riverside Methodist Hospital parking garage earlier this week because the garage doesn't take credit cards. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so she's, you know, trying to get out. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, and the person's like, well, you can pay with a debit card. It's like, I don't have a debit card. It's like, you can pay with cash. I don't have any cash. You know, because a lot of people now, especially younger people, that's a very strange thing to them. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do? Live in this parking garage? And she actually <laughs> was calling me while this was going on. I'm like, well, you'll just be like that. Um, maybe about the guy that was in the airport for two or three years. You know, just find it, find right. something you can do in the parking garage and whatever. Absolutely exactly. So, so the, yeah. So a, yeah. A, a, the end result was is that they gave her an envelope to say, well, you know, just mail it to us, which was interesting yeah, because it's like, all right.